Yes, the response is yes. And indeed, a COVID-19 infection will provide a protective immunological response naturally. However, what we know is that uh, the nature and the time the antibodies last is unknown yet with the disease itself. So it's still advisable to get the second dose of the vaccine after recovering. And we know that for these patients, in such scenario, it may need to adapt the timeline for the recommendation to have the second dose in order not to miss the second dose. So what we advise is indeed to have the second dose the sooner the better if the time has, uh, has uh, lasts longer than the period where it should be uh, uh, used. Yes, yeah, so this is the, the indeed the vaccine that has been authorized on the website of the European Medicine Agency. And you see that these vaccines have been authorized uh, uh, according to a conditional marketing authorization. This is uh, new, this is not adapted for COVID-19 vaccines. If you go to the next slide, uh, what we know is that the European Medicine Agency condition marketing authorization may be granted or in grant is granted uh, if uh, different criteria are met. And the first one, and I think this is maybe the most important one, is that the benefit-risk balance has already been considered positive at the time of this condition marketing authorization. So we have data on quality, efficacy and safety that allows to conclude that the benefit-risk balance is positive. Secondly, it is likely that the applicant will be able also to provide comprehensive post-authorization data. And these uh, post-authorization data and these conditions are associated with the marketing authorization. For instance, with the vaccine, we know that the majority of the clinical trials are still ongoing with the vaccine that will deliver data on efficacy and safety over time. And so for this one, uh, it is anticipated that we will get over time this data, for instance, the uh, duration of the efficacy of the vaccine over time, and so it does not mean that the benefit risk is doubtful. It just means that the benefit risk is positive, but we will gather additional data. And the third condition that you, of course, know and that has been met indeed is that the medicine fulfill an unmet medical need. There's no, I would say, question to, to question the fact that there is an unmet medical need with the vaccines. And finally, uh, as I have said, the benefit of the medicine uh, immediate availability uh, to patient is greater than the risk inherent to the fact that additional data are still required. So it means that, again, we have enough data on the benefit risk that allow to use the vaccine. Usually, this condition marketing authorization are valid for one year. And of course, as for any medicine, if we have some troubles regarding new data on the risk or the benefit, these conditions, this marketing authorization may be suspended, withdrawn, for instance, associated to, to a referral procedure. So no, it's not unusual. We have other medicines, I will not cite other one, but especially for when they met these criteria, for instance, anti-cancer agents, when we have unmet medical need for other medicine, we propose this kind of marketing authorization. So the question of the safety uh, is also uh, to be linked in the context of the benefits, because even if it's safe, if there is no benefit, it makes no sense. So yes, COVID-19 vaccines, whatever the COVID-19 vaccine authorized at EU level may be administered to most people with underlying medical condition. We do not have today contraindication except contraindication with a specific allergy to one of the constituents of the vaccine, but not with certain uh, underlying uh, medical condition. What is quite important to know also is that usually the underlying medical conditions are at increased risk of severe illness from the virus that caused COVID-19. So on the opposite, usually people with a chronic health condition should be prioritized for the vaccination with COVID-19 vaccines. And where we have some, of course, uh, gaps in information, but where we do not have contraindication, but support for the use of the vaccine is, for instance, people who have weakened immune system, for instance, people with HIV are not contraindicated, they are even uh, supported to be used as priority in some member states. This is the case, for instance, in Belgium, they were prioritized when compared to general population people who have autoimmune condition, or even people who have previously had 
uh, neurological conditions such as G uh, GBS, Guillain-Barré syndrome, are or may uh, take the vaccine. This is not contraindicated, and usually they are prioritized to take the vaccine. So there is no today chronic health condition where we will not uh, propose to use the vaccine, except maybe at individual level where it is uh, uh, needs to be discussed, as you mentioned in the introduction, with uh, your own uh, physician. Yes, I would say first, uh, usually people uh, with autoimmune disease uh, were not involved in the clinical trials. So what we know is that in terms of benefits and safety, we lack a lot of data. But it does not mean that there are high risks of adverse events. What it means, and it is well known, is that people with autoimmune condition who may receive a COVID-19 vaccine may be uh, uh, less uh, effic uh, less. Uh, effective uh, than uh, other people. And this is why in some countries they are already anticipating the lack of efficacy or the decreased efficacy of these vaccines to use a third dose, for instance, of a vaccine. This is proposed in some countries. And, uh, and I guess that in the near future, this will be proposed in many countries as well. Also, what we need to know is that for all the vaccine authorized at EU level, they are in, as part of post-authorization efficacy study, uh, uh, studies that will address the efficacy of the vaccine in uh, uh, um, uh, immune suppressed patient, either immune because they're a suppressed patient because they take immunosuppressant or because they have autoimmune disease. Yes, uh, different things. First, indeed, at the European Medicine Agency, AstraZeneca has been aligned with the Janssen vaccine in terms of warning and uh, adverse events associated with uh, the adenovirus vaccine. So what we call the thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, we have the same warning and the same, uh, I would say, causality assessment that show that both vaccines were associated uh, with a causal association with uh, this TTS syndrome. And we have indeed different cases with venous thrombosis, usually venous thrombosis, including unusual sites such as CVST, what we call cerebral venous sinus thrombosis or splanchnic vein thrombosis. And uh, what we said and uh, what we have seen is that usually this case appears within the first three weeks after the vaccination and occurred mostly in women under 60 years of age. I think that new data show that the, a, the, the gender balance uh, is less pronounced than it was in the beginning, where we had more than 80, 90 percent that were women. Now, with the vaccine it is around maybe 60 percent that are women when compared to 40 percent males. What is quite important, and this is really important, not only for the patient, but also for the healthcare professional, is that at the level of the European Medicine Agency, we have clearly advised to look in the symptoms associated with the disease and the one are presented on this slide. And I would say uh, there is a list of symptoms. Uh, you see shortness of breath, chest pain, leg swelling, leg pain. Uh, and these need to be looked really in detail, especially I think the most consistent that we have, we have followed a series of cases in Belgium, is a persistent headaches or blurred visions that do not appear in the following days after the vaccination, but usually after four or five days at minimum up to uh, 30 days. And for these individuals, they need to be diagnosed with thrombocytopenia within three weeks after the vaccination. But when they have thrombocytopenia, they need to be actively investigated also for sign of thrombosis and the other way around. When they have thrombosis, they need to be looked at uh, signs of thrombo uh, thrombocytopenia. And most importantly, what we have seen is that these cases need to be uh, assessed and rapidly sent to specialized clinical management uh, facilities because it, it needs to, to be taken care of by some specialists in the field. And now the European Medicine Agency has also published uh, quite recently, uh, last week, a list of uh, uh, national guidance uh, that may be used for diagnosis and for treatment of these cases. The Brighton definition has also proposed a definition of these cases. So I think there is not much new, but more information about the diagnosis, about the treatment, more alignment with the different vaccine, Vaxevria and uh, the vaccine Janssen, and uh, the reminder to really looked in details in cases and symptoms by the physician and the patient itself.
I would say, of course, it's a tricky question because new COVID-19 variants is are the, the, the one that we know today. I don't know the one that we will know in the future. If you have posed this question in February, we would never discuss about the Delta variant, which is the Indian variant. So I think uh, things are moving, of course. So my question would, my answer would be clear. I think maybe. Maybe it will be the case, but not only for the COVID-19 variant. We do not know the duration of protection of the vaccine against any variants or any strains, even if you do not have a variant. And this is the answer that is in line with my answer with the conditional marketing authorizations. We do not know the duration of the vaccine, whatever the variant I would say. So it may well be that we will need a booster, uh, whatever the variants. What is important is that, uh, yes, uh, on the 14th of June, uh, so two days ago, the Public Health uh, England has published a study that showed that for the first time, two doses of the COVID-19 vaccines, uh, uh, Vaxevria and Pfizer, are highly effective against hospitalization from the Delta variant. So you might have an increase of the uh, of the infection, but you will still maintain, I would say, the hospitalization level to uh, uh, a limited uh, a limited level. And this was the case for the Pfizer uh, uh, that was effective in 96% after two doses and for the uh, Vaxevria, the Oxford vaccine, 92%. So it means that, uh, yes, you will prevent again the hospitalization on the different COVID-19 variants, but it does not mean that for instance, in uh, October, November, especially high-risk population, immunocom uh, immunocompromised patients, as I have said, or uh, elderly patients may need a booster because of the immunosenescence in the elderly population. We know that we might need a booster, but not only for the COVID-19 variant, for all variants, I would say. Now, I think that the main difficulty, of course, today is that we are a bit biased uh, with the clinical trials. The clinical trials has been, has been performed and are still ongoing and started usually for the phase three with the vaccine of interest at EU level in, in uh, July, August last year. So we can do many things, but now go uh, faster than time. So we will have over time the information about the efficacy of the vaccine in the uh, epidemiological situation where they've been studied. So we, over time, we are, uh, we, we are gaining information about the duration. So what we might expect today is that indeed they protect for at least nine, 12 months at minimum. But of course, depending on the variants, depending on the vaccines, it may be decreased. And if we have a, 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 a waning over time of the efficacy of the vaccine, plus the variant for which we might have a, a, an escape, of the immune, um, immune response, then uh, we might indeed need a boost. And what type of boost being either the same vaccine that you have had in the past or a mixed match or an adapted vaccines, for, for instance, an mRNA vaccine that would be adapted for some variants. So all these questions are, I would say, linked together. But uh, uh, what we expect if that if there was no variant, if there was a few waning of the efficacy of the vaccine, is that at least they would last for, in terms of efficacy, for uh, 18, 24 months at least. Any of the currently authorized COVID-19 vaccine at EU level is contraindicated in pregnant or lactating women. So they can be administered to pregnant or lactating women. Uh, but there is no statement of a product of preference today by either the European Medicine Agency, for instance. But still, if you remember well, in some member states, in some countries, there are some limitation of use of some vaccines today based on the age. I take the adenovirus vaccines, Vaxevria and Janssen, in some countries in less than 50 years of age. And so by definition, usually this one will not be proposed in pregnant women because they should not use the vaccine because of their age. When it comes to pregnant people, why a vaccine would be interesting? Because observational data demonstrate that pregnant women with COVID-19 have an increased risk of fever illness, and they are at increased risk of preterm birth and may be at an increased risk of adverse pregnancy complications and outcomes such as preeclampsia or coagulopathy and stillbirth. So yes, they might be recommended, they may be recommended, they are not contraindicated. We have now accumulating evidence from non-clinical studies, but also clinical studies where we had some pregnancy that 
did not show any harm. We have in the US publication from the CDC in the uh, vaccine safety related database that show that today in the VC pregnancy registry, which collects more detailed data on people who are pregnant and their infants, that early data did not identify any safety concern for, for, for pregnant pe uh, people. And on top of that, we have at the EU level, at least at the European Medicine Agency, some uh, programs to follow also uh, these, uh, these pregnancies. So, so far, so good, I would say, with the pregnancy and lactating women, lactating people, I think, uh, there, we, it is really with no concern since we have seen that both the vaccine, whatever the vaccine, they do not cross the, to, 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 to the milk. So lactating women is not a problem.